Good morning, everyone. We're going to spend a while talking about illusions, and in particular, breaking illusions. So, the story starts kind of a few years ago. I would like to say, not in a galaxy very far away, just, you know, in Finland, where I'm from. And uh, I identify very much as a feedback fairy. I have my golden wand and all things like that. Feedback fairy meaning that I usually work in teams, I come with a gift of feedback, and many people would call me a tester. So, what I do is testing, what I love is testing, and I really enjoy working together with whole teams and, and, and doing all testing-related stuff. And a few years ago, uh, I wanted to do a session for a conference about testing something without a user interface. So I took a look at somebody's system. There was a nice developer who kind of volunteered that, you know, if you want to test something in public, you can test my thing. Like, you know, I don't mind. And Approval test is basically this the testing library where you can create uh, golden master files and there's no user interface, like any unit testing things. It's something of that sort. I'm like, yeah, sure, you know, I'll, I'll take that. I don't really care what I'm exploring, what I'm looking at. You know, probably there's things that I'm going to be finding. And the end result was this. So, uh, the developer in question, uh, an American man uh, with a little bit of an attitude sometimes, he uh, kind of got surprised. He said that whatever I was about to do on his thing, in a couple of hours, I broke it, I destroyed it completely, uh, and uh, the words that he was using kind of uh, were pretty strong on, on that side. So, I took the challenge. I spent some time with the application. I didn't think I was doing anything particular, you know, like I set it up, I set up the environment, I look at the documentation, I tried to use his unit test that he had for the system, and, you know, pretty much none of that worked quite as, as I would have assumed. And the, the API itself, it was completely undiscoverable for somebody who was new with the documentation at hand. So sure, you know, I broke something, but it wasn't actually his software that I broke, it was just his illusions. And this is what I keep on doing, like, you know, this one thing a few years back, it's just a reflection of all of the things that I've been doing for the last 25 years. And I absolutely love doing testing. I love looking at things we believe in, I love looking at the software and figuring out if it works as we intended, or if there is something, some information that I could bring back as a feedback fairy, hopefully with a smile on my face, and not, you know, delivering the message of, you know, by the way, your baby is kind of ugly, <laughs> uh, in a nasty way, but rather, you know, figure out a way of, of, of approaching things as in, like, uh, uh, this is a bug that is so cool that I can't even believe that somebody would intentionally do this. This is actually not intentional, it is just surprising. And a lot of the things that I keep on finding are like that. So, I spend my time a lot breaking illusions. But I've been doing this for 25 years. So, kind of like, you know, looking over time, like, I feel like I've always been doing testing, I've always been a tester, but yet I find that when I look at people joining the industry right now, they're very much doing different things than I am. Like, I don't even notice when I'm growing. So, I also identify as a polyglot programmer. A couple of years back, I realized I've been programming in 15 languages, but I never talk about that, really. Uh, right now, for the last six months, I've been a manager of a development team of 12, and I work my ass off. I don't know if I was allowed to say that, but I work a lot for the idea that my job still looks exactly the same as it used to look as a tester. So there are many things where you can change roles and grow and do all kinds of things, but there's still some kind of a home ground that you identify with. And these breaking illusions, and the skills around that. I don't think it's just something that testers need to learn. Testers cultivate that skill often, because when you have your mind space focused on a particular thing and learning that thing, you know, if you're actively learning, you're usually getting better at that, right? But uh, 
Instead of thinking of this as only testers doing it, I find that some of the best explorers, some of the best testers in my teams that I've worked with in the recent years are developers, business analysts, all that sort of, of, of uh, groups. So for me, looking at these basic illusions, or the, uh, the breaking illusions, it kind of splits into, uh, over time, I've been thinking about this a lot, it splits into six illusions that I find that I need to spend time on. So the basic ones are things around, you know, what people usually assume testers might do. Uh, looking at the code, whether it does what it was supposed to do. Like if, you know, programmer had an intent, it had a specification, it had somebody's expectation of what it was supposed to be doing. Is it actually doing that? And I would wish that in the current uh, test-driven, test-oriented, test-infected team's world, I wouldn't have to find so many problems around this. And I am really happy with the 25 years of, of timeline to notice that this is now a very, very small portion of my time in general. Like, you know, if we know what we want, there are many people who can, can check for that. But then there's this whole space of like, what we wanted, is it what we really, really wanted? Is it what really matters to the users, whether that's the right thing to build? And uh, a lot of times, did we know enough about the environment that we were building for? So that's another thing that I often find myself looking at. And the third basic illusion is, well, security-related things. I work in a security company, especially right now, so for the last two and a half years. And I find a lot of times finding that, you know, there's this <coughs> remote execution possibility. It wasn't supposed to do that, but if it does that, I would like to know. And, and these are kind of like, you know, everyday discussions around what kind of feedback we might, might need to be delivering, what kind of illusions need breaking. But I also, with the 25 years of kind of like growing and taking different kinds of, of roles and different kinds of responsibilities, well, actually, not taking different kinds of roles, but just responsibilities. I find that I'm also doing uh, other illusion breaking around things like: uh, Are we working in the right way? Is the process something that we actually, you know, enjoy and like? Uh, whether the people actually know how to do things properly, if they should actually go on a training course or, or you know, just pair up with somebody else or, or learn things that way and also with the business models. But like, this is a list, and this doesn't actually tell you much about what does it really mean in practice. So let's look at a little bit of that practice. Like, what does it look like? What did I actually do? What, did I, what was it that I did that I thought was nothing? But apparently it was something, because this developer with the open source project and, and all the focus on test-driven development didn't manage to find all the problems that I managed to find. So what I did, basically, is that I looked at the API. The, the product, the application that I had, kind of as, as uh, if it was supposed to speak to me. And with 25 years of, of uh, uh, program uh, whispering experience, it actually does speak to me. I don't think I'm completely insane, but I do hear applications, all kinds of interfaces telling me, oh, you'd want to try this value. You'd want to click here. Oh, you want to do that twice. There was something interesting that you saw the first time. Maybe you didn't pay attention. And I am a lot more creative at discovering that new information with the program in front of my face. With a picture, I can also do a lot of things. With the um, uh, post-its on the wall, I already can do a lot of things. They're also one kind of uh, external imagination. But there's something particular about the real executable application that makes you learn uh, more vivid things. So the first thing kind of that I did is uh, I follow this main rule. We usually in testing, we call these heuristics. My main heuristic is never, ever be bored. And some people who have ideas about what testers do, this might be you know, completely against whatever you're thinking about testing. But I have to tell you that I have never ever done boring clickety-click -click work before I became a manager. Then I have to go every single week and press the approve button for people's hours. I never ever did that as a tester. So when I look at an application as my external imagination, I look at it and my kind of like past experience with it as in, what have I not yet learned? What new could I bring into this, you know, spending time with this? And uh, what did I do last time so that I can intentionally do things differently? 
And this increases my chances of running into problems that you know, nobody expected. Another heuristic is that uh, when you start off with something, you can't actually expect very high, high things of, of you know, doing the best job ever. So, sure, you have your, your history and your knowledge from the past projects and all that, but every new system is a new system. You need to be actually approaching it as a, as a new problem, and, and you're learning about that particular problem, and you're trying to be aware of the things that are baggage from your, your old past experiences, and also the ones that you know would be usable here. So again, the idea of changing whatever you can. And this heuristic is particularly important in the sense that the first thing that I do is not that I write test automation. The first thing that I do is not that I create test cases. The first thing I do is I explore the application before I am ready to create documentation. And then I can decide whether automation in nine times out of ten is the right way of documenting that result of whatever I was discovering with the application. And this is actually how test automation is built in general. Someone first discovers stuff about the application. How long they spend on discovering before they start creating documentation. There's many variances to that. But you don't do that when you know the least. That usually means then that you would have to rediscover things if, if you would go for that. So, uh, for that, uh, approval tests in particular, I had to uh, uh, learn it a little bit, write some notes for myself, but uh, I wasn't intending to do automation, but you can't run an API without automation. So I had some throwaway automation. A third thing, uh, again, heuristic going into more specifics, is uh, this idea that uh, when you see something that you can play with, you keep on poking it. This is something Alexander Schladebeck, a lady from, from Germany suggests that actually a lot of testers seem to be doing, so we're naming these heuristics very actively. So you keep on trying until you know you find something. And when you're persistent with whatever you're learning and, and you want to really understand that deeper, that is usually providing you more information. But I also have you know, this whole history of working with testing and all of the heuristics for quite some time. I know that you can't read all of those heuristics, but we have loads of them in the testing community, and we share them very actively. So the heuristic table of testing has some of the things, kind of like how you approach things like idea generation. How do you know if things are correct, consistent, with different kinds of things. There's approaches on, on how you could test, how you could look at uh, non-functional uh, non aspects. So there's many, many different ways of approaching a problem. And when I go into a new product, looking at that as my external imagination, this is the tool set that I come to the product with. Like, I know all of these heuristics. And there's one particular one that I applied first with approval tests. So the first thing that I did with approval tests is that I you know, was looking at it and I wanted to kind of generate ideas from, from different perspectives. So you know, it has some kind of structure, so I opened the, 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 the IDE and I, I browsed through whatever structures there were. I, I realized that there were some, some names that I didn't like, I kind of didn't understand, you know, already building a mental model of what that structure looked like. But usually going to uh, developer's code, that's not where I provide the most value in a couple of hours. So what I focus on first usually is functions. You know, what do I do with that? I also would look at things that it can eat, what kind of data it takes, what's the platform it kind of resides on, what's the environment it requires. So I also keep kind of build this environment where it uses a couple of drivers uh, on my different language systems, and I was comparing between different languages. So all of these were generating ideas on, on you know, I'm making choices, I have very little time, and I want to provide some useful information. I want to help and teach people how to, to do that. And also, uh, operations, kind of like long-term things, like why would anyone want to use this type of questions? And time, usually time is something that is always difficult when you, you identify it with an application. So I looked at things, I couldn't make sense of things easily, so obviously I wouldn't spend time alone in my chamber. I had the developer, so I asked him, like, what is this supposed to be doing? And he gave me this list. Like, you know, one half of it, called approvers, does this. The other half of it, called reporters, is supposed to do this. I'm like, ooh, rich source of claims. I can test it against any of these. And again, I can easily spend weeks 
actually finding more problems with every single one of these, and yet still I have only spent a limited amount of time trying to find, find problems in that. I also drew this uh, kind of like a sketch for myself, you know, a model of, of what kind of environment it sits in, so it's somewhere in the middle. It uses all kinds of, of, of uh, things, test runners, diff tools, documentation exists, all that sort of things. So the things I had to find is that the unit test didn't run on my machine, or actually some of them at all. They had forgotten to uh, 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 put in the latest changes towards the unit test that were fixing them, so they actually had a broken version out there. So that was kind of like the first thing that I had to discover. Then the second thing that I had to discover was that uh, uh, when I had two runners, I was doing C sharp first, and I had both N unit and, and another runner on my, my environment. Uh, it wouldn't actually start at all, so apparently no one had told him or even tried, you know, using an environment multiple runners. It was supposed to be working. There was no reason why it wouldn't, except that it didn't. And uh, then uh, I tried copy-pasting from documentation, finding that it was images, so you can't really copy-paste from images, and then kind of trying to discover the API was really difficult. So there were many, many things that kind of, from different perspective, ended up uh, coming out. And of course, since I was learning about the application in a limited time, I was also making loads of notes on, on what kind of things I was learning and categorizing this. And I would love sometimes to take a video of how these mind maps that I create while, while I'm testing, how they kind of like emerge, how things change and move, because even negative space, empty space or unbalanced uh, view in a mind map is actually a heuristic that tells me that there's either a wrong model for me here or I am missing something. And all of these kind of things uh, are things that I might want to be reacting to. So this is an example of doing things with an application. Like I do this for my work all the time. I approach different kind of features this way. Uh, I get involved early on. If we're ever doing any uh, like whiteboard work, I try to do it there as well. Uh, but a lot of times, listing all the possible ways it can break very early on, it's, by the way, the best way to kill something that actually could be valuable, but you haven't yet quite figured it out. So sometimes that's the reason why, why uh, uh, some testers are not always welcome in the, the early stages. Like, if you feel uh, half of the time with something negative, that might not be the, the best way to do things. But then again, we can all prioritize. But I also realized, you know, that looking at these basic illusions, that there's a bonus one, clearly, uh, on top of this, this approval test experience and highlight, which is around uh, my, my current work. So, uh, there's also this illusion that whatever we tested, whatever was the best that we could do while testing, we think that it's, you know, good enough and, and you know, we already found relevant bugs and we fixed many of them. But when you put things in production, you can have things like, um, we have this one system that I'm testing right now with one million users, about, give or take. Uh, one million users, and when we started uh, introducing through testing ideas, and like we want to figure things out, like how does it actually work, telemetry, so that it tells us when errors happen, we realized that about half of the people who are trying to use it actually are not able to use it. And we learned that that has been the case for years, and yet they don't call home. So, a lot of times, this is the change that I need to be driving, this is the illusion that I need to be driving, that the work we do in the name of testing within our companies already is sufficient. Usually it isn't. The real users are so much more versatile that we want to get the, the feedback, feedback from them as well. But again, I've spent a few years on learning to do this stuff and, and kind of figuring out what kind of illusions are there. And I'm realizing that uh, while I still spend more than half of my time hands-on with the application and, and enjoying uh, the fact that we are releasing fairly consistently about every two weeks, every week, uh, into uh, the million users that we're serving, they are Windows machines, so the continuous delivery means physically installing one million machines somewhere out there across the world. So that's a, a different level of, of continuous delivery. Again, an illusion that uh, I was told two and a half years ago, it's impossible to do. Seems to be quite possible, we're doing it right now. So, uh, there's many of these things and claims that people have, where 
uh, you actually, when you have this mindset of, of paying attention to illusions, you feel like, oh, we need to change the world. Like, it's, it's not really like this. So the first type that I wanted to talk to you about is this illusion of business models. Like, we believe that, you know, whoever represents the business, we have some people who represent the business, and even in, in this audience, we somehow believe that they have this magical information, that they know what actually the end users are willing to pay for. And they usually know a lot of that stuff. Like they, they know how to go and ask the users, and, and the users will give you, you answers like, oh yes, I would absolutely love that feature. In my previous place of work, we had one of those cases where we were asked to do a, a relevant-sized feature, and we went and asked the user on like, would they actually want that? And, oh, yes, we absolutely love it, we, we need it. And we started working out all the details of how they want it. But I was sensing that there is something fishy here. There's something that I am not quite convinced with. And what I wasn't convinced with was the, the salespeople's belief that this is going to make more money for us, and that this customer actually would be willing to, you know, put their money where their mouth is. So I devised a little test. I went to the business people and I suggested, uh, what if we made a contract that they pay, you know, 5, 10%? It doesn't really matter, but, you know, contractually, we bind them and they pay some money up front, you know, you can even have all the money up front. I can make a promise that if, you know, that is, you know, something that they want, like, you know, we'll figure out a way of delivering that incrementally so that they don't have to wait their whole life. It's not that big. We can make these arrangements. And we went and did that. And what we learned is that the customer wanted the feature as long as it didn't cost a cent. So sometimes these kind of illusions where, you know, you think you do all this work and it pays off, they are the most expensive illusions that I find that I have to break with. Break, uh, uh, break, uh, and, and uh, also things around kind of uh, how much do we need to test and how good a quality something needs to be before it hits the users the first time. It's an illusion that I find that I have to break with the testing community a lot of times. Like, we don't want to invest upfront all the money when we don't actually yet know if the customers are really going to flock in with the features that we have, have in mind. There's also this little nice illusion that I find myself telling stories about uh, around how we deliver software. Uh, a lot of times, people believe that when you get a bigger thing, it's going to be cheaper. And I really enjoy this Alan Kelly's illustration that software is really actually cheapest in the small cartons. And this is pretty much the illusion that I, I work with when I want to deliver every two weeks, every week, to the million users. So that we can control the risk that is related to us breaking the systems that, that we're building. Then, another type of illusion that I find myself uh, breaking a lot of times is, you know, people and, and skills related. And having kind of this, this knowledge and, and understanding on how things work. And I wanted to take a specific example of this. So, two and a half years ago, I joined my current team. And I absolutely love and adore my team. But uh, back then, uh, we were a little bit challenged. We were a new team, we hadn't really worked together, so we did some team building related activities. And I organized this team building where we went to this uh, escape room called Hannibal. So there's this serial killer that is, is after you and you have one hour to escape, like, you know, awesome thing to do with, with your teammates. But there was one detail that I didn't tell my teammates about this fun experience, which was that I had been there before. I actually haven't officially told them still yet, so uh, maybe they will learn after I talk about this on this stage. I've done it on other stages, so yet I have been safe. And it's also on my blog, it has been already for years, so you know, it's not like it's private information. But I didn't tell them that I had been there before. So I wanted to, you know, figure out if, if we work as a team, and in particular, how I, the tester in that team, was treated, heard, and listened to. 
And it was kind of interesting, you know, people being in these different places and, and trying to get out. And, and I was trying to interject sometimes, you know, when people first figured it out themselves, like I wouldn't do anything, I would just, you know, enjoy the ride. But when we got stuck, like I knew the right answers. There was this one particular case where there was this table and you had to actually, you know, get on that table with your hands, you know, all the way uh, 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 out there, and you had to scream. You had to scream your lungs out. That was the only way to go forward. And there were hints, you know, giving us this information. And I knew this because I didn't figure it out last time I was in the room. And I counted 12 times of mentioning that in different ways, kind of like trying to highlight it to my teams. And then actually, the final thing, having to physically get on that table because I wasn't listened to. The information that was correct wasn't paid attention to. So sometimes the skills that we need to build in the teams are the skills of hearing everyone. And in particular, when we're doing design-related work, when we're doing implementation-related work, the best ideas are not the ones, necessarily, where people shout the loudest, but there might be really good ideas. Actually, usually there are really good ideas from the, the people that we normally don't get to hear. So this might be something to, to pay attention to. Then the fourth uh, uh, special type of illusion is about the processes, the ways we work, and, and this is definitely my all-time favorite illusion nowadays to break. So I still enjoy hands-on software, and I, you know, I cry little tears if I can't spend my, my time with the application that we're building every single work week, but this is where a lot of my energy uh, actually comes from comes from. So uh, the processes, the ways we work, they might be uh, 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 very different in, in many ways. So one of the illusions that I particularly enjoy is this one about how it's effective for us to work. So this is a picture of, of uh, a meetup group. Uh, I'm one of the people there in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the picture. And we're all staring at this one screen where there's one person on a computer doing something. So about four years ago, I had a pleasure of meeting a wonderful gentleman, actually here in the first row, Woody's Wheel. And uh, he did a talk at a conference I was organizing. And he talked about this idea of mob programming, using only a single computer as your, your, your entry point to programming and having the whole team uh, work in a particular structure, and I was like, that's the craziest idea I've ever heard. Like, that's not going to work. And this is a heuristic that has also before proved to be really, really powerful uh, for me. So when I recognized myself thinking, uh, that is impossible, it would never work, I tried to stop and think on like, but that person, you know, that's a smart person, they have real experiences, maybe I'm wrong, <coughs> maybe they're right. And I can't say that if I didn't try that again with whatever I have now learned about the thing, that it's actually so bad thing. So I spent some time, probably three, four, six months, I don't remember the time frames exactly anymore. I spent some time convincing my team that, that you know, we would want to try this thing called more programming. And they were absolutely refusing. Like, no way. That's the stupidest thing that we could ever have, have heard. And overall, then I figured out that the best way to get that done in my then team was to say, like, oh, I'm feeling kind of lonely here. I'm the only tester. I don't, you know, I don't get enough attention. I, 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 I you know, need to, you know, humor me a little bit here. And they said, like, okay, fine. We can do anything for two hours for you. Like, that thing is stupid still, but anything for you for two hours. And uh, we uh, sat together in a room, we had a, a, a facilitator, we were doing uh, refactoring, cleaning up code, uh, renaming, uh, pulling out methods, uh, restructuring things, uh, committing regularly, uh, and we learned tons in that two hours about each other, about the ways different people worked, uh, and also about the, the status of, of what kind of models, what kind of things we had in the code, and how that matched whatever models I had. So this was a good experience. There was one person in my team who didn't really enjoy it much. Uh, they said that uh, it feels like we're in kindergarten. And also then we learned that, you know, if people don't like it, you know, it's okay for them to opt out. Then the rest of us can have the party. And, and well, if, with about uh, six months of doing this every two weeks, they said that, oh, that looks like a fun thing. Can I come join? So 
again, when people are clearly enjoying themselves and having fun, it invites them, them in. But for me, the main takeaway from this whole mobbing thing was that I had forgotten that I have a computer science <laughs> studies thing behind me. I had forgotten all the languages that they made me program in, in school. I had forgotten that I can actually do all of that. And I realized that, you know, I can start doing it again. And I also found new ways of doing it. For example, the big insight for me was that uh, uh, real developers, Google, nobody told me that. <laughs> what's, what's the deal with that? So uh, I wasn't actually so bad. Googling, and these kind of things kind of like opened up things for me. And also, looking at my blog, I realized that I was saying, I will never want to be a programmer. And now I'm saying, yeah, I'm a poly polyglot programmer. I kind of confidently, you know, do that with my, my teams and pair up with, with different kind of people. So this idea of cognitive dissonance, sometimes things that are part of your identity, you feel you don't do them because they are not you. And when you end up doing them kind of by accident, you rewrite your whole history, and that's what, what happened to me. So there are big, big illusions that we need to also break on our own belief systems, and, and this whole idea of uh, programming was, was one for me. I also uh, do a lot of uh, uh, process-related illusion breaking in my own organization, and I know that I probably have people uh, hating me for the no, 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 no list, but uh, that's actually uh, the easiest way for me to describe uh, the ways we've learned to work in, in my team right now. Well, we do continuous delivery, we talked about that already. And the continuous delivery is not kind of the usual continuous delivery, because it was the little illusion of, yeah, we can install a million machines every, every week if we want to. So uh, the AWS-related uh, services actually made that made that uh, much more possible than it used to be back when we were telling that, that it is completely impossible. I stopped using Jira years ago. Like, I am a tester and I don't write Jira tickets if I can avoid it. And what it means is that uh, the 10 minutes that I could write the ticket on, I use that 10 minutes to walking to that person or talking to that person, making a call to that person if, if they're in a different, <laughs> different country, and I make them see what the problem is. And if they're like, oh, you know, can you write me a Jira ticket so that I remember it later? Well, it doesn't seem to be very important. So, you know, you can just forget it or you can make your own notes. You know, that's a, an, a, an appropriate way of doing it. Or more likely, like, you know, I have time now. We could pair. I could learn something while we're pairing. Like, I love doing this, this stuff. So trying to kind of uh, introduce a more collaborative way of working. No estimates uh, is something that I avoid mentioning, usually in public, because there's so much uh, uh, weird discussions around it. But the simple idea of rather asking, like, uh, not asking how long is it going to take for us, but like, can we make it smaller? That's so powerful that with the time of, of not doing the estimates magic, we've done other magic for our end users. Uh, a year ago, we got rid of our product owner. Uh, it happened so that first they were sitting in our room and everyone was sort of reporting to them, so the team dynamic was a bit off in that sense. I first uh, went to the product owner's manager and asked if the product owner could move into another floor. It's kind of like you know, shipping them to another country, that's how it, it works. And uh, yeah, a few weeks later, they changed the room, the team uh, was completely in a mess trying to figure out who do we talk to now that we don't have the one person to talk to, and we figured out that we could actually talk to each other. And then over time, we realized that, you know, it was so difficult, you know, you had to ask that person who wasn't in the room, I'm like, what do you want to ask? Like, what does he say? Actually realizing that we had most of the answers already in the team, so we introduced this idea of, of uh, not allocating the most important problem that we have in software development, which is the customer and making customers awesome to single person and single role, but actually sharing it amongst us. We changed the product owner kind of as it was before. We changed it into this, this idea of, um, of you go fishing for us. Like if there's a gazillion customer meetings, we don't want to sit in those, at least not all of them, because there's so many of them. You go fish, bring us fish. And remember, if you bring us a bucket of fish so that we can make food for uh, the family for dinner, 
and we only need two fish to, to feed the whole family, and the rest of it is probably going to rot. So, you know, pick the best fish instead of carrying it all around. It's going to be heavy work for you as well. So it has, you know, improved a lot of the, the ways we work with the customers. And I was kind of happy to realize that next week, I again called one of our customers and partners and said, like, hey, can you come over to t talk to our development team? Like, yeah, sure, what time? Would Wednesday be okay? So uh, having this, this kind of relationship where even in a product company with a lot of customers, you can actually call different ones to get the, the perspectives without a filter that we have at least learned that uh, it's actually seems to be creating illusions rather than, than dispelling them. So we did that. Then uh, no product projects is a thing also we, we try to do. So continuously flowing features through the whatever machinery we have rather than setting up these, these big elaborate things. The whole organization is still very much on the projects, but, but my team is, is trying to work on, on a bit different way. And no scrum, basically meaning that whenever something is ready, kind of Kanban style, like pulling it and, and putting it in production. If it's valuable enough, there's no reason why we actually need to have a cadence for, for releasing. We have uh, brought all of that stuff uh, down a lot. So, all of these things, around illusions. They're really about learning. They're really about the idea that when you go to work, I would hope that every single one of you go to work with the attitude that every single day is a chance of learning. Software industry seems to be doubling in size every five years, which basically means that if we have a representative group of people at our work or in this kind of setting, about half of us would have less than five years of experience. We don't all have all of the knowledge and experiences, but we can definitely uh, get started with, with learning. It's not about someone knowing kind of absolutely more than somebody else. Uh, we all have things to learn from each other. And some of my, my uh, fondest memories of learning in the last two years come from the fellow who joined us two years ago at age of 15, and me forcing them through all kinds of things, including talking on a stage in front of 500 people at the age of 16. So, there's many different ways for us to learn, but it starts off with appreciating that we want to do it, and every single contact we make with others is a chance of doing that. Looking at things from this tester kind of perspective, you have this idea that whatever someone models, I'm talking to a modeling community in, in particular, whatever someone models, when you look at it differently, you probably are going to see something else. So no matter what model my teams draw me, I will always draw another picture that looks different. There has never been a model that I can agree with, because I never agree with myself when I sleep over the night. And it is really useful in breaking those illusions. So, from one angle, yeah, sure, it says, you can look at it, it looks like a cat. The other angle, uh, it says it's a bird. But actually, uh, the way I look at it is not whatever the labels say. I'm noticing it's hand-drawn. You know, some of the lines are a bit, you know, fluffy, like they, they're not quite uh, strongly drawn. And I wonder if that's intentional, if it was, you know, meant to be that way. Maybe it's supposed to communicate something. Maybe, you know, maybe there's a thing that I could see, just focusing on that particular aspect. I'm also seeing some kind of shape. Some of them are closed, some of them are open. Maybe the shapes mean something. And uh, just the color of the paper seems to be really complicated to have you know, entered into this particular picture so that I can not turn it into nice and white. Maybe there's an intention behind that. So all of these things, kind of looking at whatever with curiosity in mind and figuring new things out, it, it brings, brings me new perspectives. So what I do, I again break the illusions. I sometimes show up at office and say, hey, do you have an hour? Let's play. I did this this week just for the purposes of, of this conference and having something really fresh for you. That's my 17-year-old uh, colleague. Uh, right there in the front. The other one has a little bit more age than, than the 17-year-old, and, well, you know, uh, a very nice group all in all. We were testing these Bogle cubes, which is basically the game of Scrabble, the word game. You, you mix them up and, and you try to generate uh, different kinds of things. 
on different kinds of, of words. And uh, what comes out uh, of this uh, was, well, we found bugs, of course, but what I really wanted to go for is, is to understand what this group of us together, what did we learn this week about testing that we either didn't know or had forgotten? So the first lesson that we learned is that uh, if we try to use these kind of systems like we were users, we're probably not going to do a really good job at testing. There's more intent to testing than what users have. A user's intent is different. Tester's intent is kind of like fast-forwarding the whole uh, uh, production uh, in, in shorter time frame and understanding where the risks and uh, new information might, might be. So we realized that there was a clear difference in, in you know, just using it to figure it out and intentionally exploring it and trying to figure things out. So we also kind of drew this on the background. You can see this, this uh, uh, text here. We listed all the features that we could find when we were exploring, and that was a big part of the, the being intentional. Uh, but then we also realized again, being reminded that the intent isn't enough. Like, you know, we can think we know things, and we know what we know, but honestly, we don't not know the things we don't know. And we can't pull that information because we don't know we're missing that information. So through that play, the thing that comes up with is serendipity, a lucky accident where you will run into a problem that you did not expect. Like, I had no clue you could do that. Like, there was no hint saying that you could do that, but you could. And with the bogle cubes, we had three sets of the bogle cubes. The surprise for us was that when we have 15 of them, we can combine them in interesting ways in the middle of the game and mess the game up in, in ways that probably no one intended. And we really didn't think of that as, as, as a thing. And also, we could play uh, with more than, than five, five cubes and, and, and work on, on that kind of things. Uh, the third thing we learned is that uh, uh, the intent means kind of recognizing your own control. Uh, when uh, you realize that something is very difficult to do, like we had these you know, randomly given letters and we needed to combine them in some way, uh, five-letter combinations, when we started generating those, they were really, really you know, long list of things. I can't actually calculate that in my head or remember how many it is, but the list was quite long. Then we realized that we can remove one cube and we have four-letter combinations, and that made the problem of what we're testing a lot more uh, manageable. So again, controlling things, controlling variables that you recognize that you have. You can do first the easy thing. It doesn't mean that you don't do the hard thing. You can do the hard thing when you have first learned how the easy thing works. So understanding kind of your power and, and the fact that when you've done it once, you're not done. It's a, it's a big uh, part of, of how you test. On testability, uh, we were really frustrated on getting always a different random five letters. So you could never verify if the score you got, or the maximum score that was our focus, if the maximum score was possible. Like you couldn't you know, make a list of things and get the exact same letters so that you can try to see if, if you can get the max score. That was way too, too complicated because you didn't have control over these, these cubes. And uh, it just reminded us that whenever we feel this way with our applications, that's the time to bring in the developers to join us, the designers to join us, the business people to join us, and share the pain of trying to do it. And usually that then means when the pain is shared, the knowledge is shared. Uh, that we build things smarter next time so that we can uh, do things a little easier. The fifth lesson that we pulled out is that uh, we realized we have tools. Uh, we were not given tools, like usually we're not actually given all the right tools, but we need to also be imagining what the tools could be like that, that we, we can use in our, our testing. Uh, you pull in, whatever you need, you build whatever you don't have. Don't just wait for someone having thought of that for you. So if you have an idea of how you could do things, follow, follow through that idea. And then uh, as the sixth lesson, uh, 
we realized that, yes, we would love to automate a lot of stuff, especially around the permutations and integrate that to Google uh, vocabulary so that we can figure out which ones are real uh, words and, and all that sort of things. And we realized that within the hour that we were intending to, to spend, we couldn't build that tool, but probably I expect to see some afternoon where someone spends a few hours building a tool like this just for uh, you know, trying out what kind of things you can do when you, you have the will and, and that power. And as the final lesson on, on this, uh, we learned it really didn't work, but uh, even if it doesn't calculate the scores right, the question it is, does it really matter? What's quality for something like, you know, fun boggle cubes? We, we were laughing for an hour on trying to, you know, put things in, in some kind of an order and, and figure out if it works. You know, as a test target, the quality is really high when you have bugs. Uh, as a game, the quality is really high when it's, it's fun and, and, and you're doing things that, that you enjoy. And uh, the problems uh, really only matter when they end up being things where people uh, react to them by walking away from your system, uh, leaving you uh, because of the problems that they're facing. And you really want to be paying attention the, to the kind of things that matter to the people who matter. So all of this illusion breaking, it's really for me, it's about a uh, uh, lucky accident, for following, like figuring out unknown unknowns, trying out hypotheses, and keeping and sticking with the problems. Uh, Longer, so the quotes that I really enjoy on, on this side is that, well, there's this, this golfer, Arnold Palmer, Palmer, who keeps saying that, or has said that if, if they practice more, they get more lucky. And a lot of times, you know, testers seem to, seem to be saying, like, you know, I'm just really lucky. Like, I don't find bugs, the bugs find me. Like, I actually have to work to find most of my bugs. You know, some of them find me, sure, but for most of them, I actually have to work for them. But uh, when you've spent long enough time with your external imagination in front of you, the bugs will wave at you and they say, look here, I'm here, you want to come here, and then you will find me. So you get more lucky over time. And also the other wise thing on, on just sticking uh, with things and, and figuring things out is, is from Albert Einstein. Not that uh, we generally are actually so smart, even the ones who are kind of considered the smartest of the, uh, the whole uh, lot, but if we just stick with the problems and we don't give up, that usually makes us a little bit more uh, uh, lucky or smart in, in getting to the, the results. So as the final idea, I kind of want to summarize this as approaching testing uh, the illusion breaking as deliberate discovery skills with an external, uh, uh, like a, uh, an external imagination that you can use. So if you look at those numbers there, one, two, four, five, what's missing in the middle? Three? This is what you're missing? But it also could be that what's missing in the middle is not three. Any other suggestions? Yeah, like time. So again, whatever you would look at, there's always a different perspective. And you have to be very actively looking for that perspective. This is something, uh, this little example is something that Liz Kio has shared with the community. And I appreciate uh, her perspective of looking at us testers on what kind of things we're doing and expressing that appreciation so that we can better talk about the things we, we do. So that's what I had to share for today. Thank you.